Professor Tony David, thank you so much for joining me today. My pleasure, my pleasure. It's really nice to have such a prolific researcher on the podcast, and we're going to discuss your views on psychiatry, some of your clinical work, but also your book, Into the Abyss, A Psychiatrist's Notes on a Troubled Mind. There's a lot that I want to talk about today, but firstly, I'd like to ask you, why do you think psychiatry remains such a controversial medical specialty? Um, well, I think it's very uh, misunderstood as a specialty. And, and one of the motivations for me writing the book was to try and give a flavor for what it's really like, um, how it's very much a part of medicine um, and shouldn't be seen as that different from other branches of medicine, although, of course, they're all different in their own way. Um, so I think that's one reason. Uh, I, I think, but everyone, everyone's interested in uh, things like motivation, um, the effects of challenges in, in life, why some people seem to do well, some, some people don't seem to do well. And of course, we're all touched by people with mental health problems in our families and our friends. You, you know, everyone knows someone who's had difficulties. In fact, most of us have had our own difficulties at some point in our lives, even though we're not quite always able to talk about it in the way we would about a physical illness. So those are the kind of um, differences and similarities between psychiatry and other branches of medicine. Yes, I think you're right. So there's a combination of misunderstanding, misconceptions, but then also everyone has a stake in it. Everyone has a vested interest. So, so lots of, you know, when I talk to people, lots of people will have an, in, an inherent interest in psychiatry in the way they wouldn't have in, for example, hematology or orthopedics. Yeah. But then the misunderstandings and also I think maybe what people project onto the specialty and what people project onto psychiatrists, I think leads to a lot of controversy, but then also the, the tremendous mystery. What, what do you think are the really common misconceptions people have about mental health conditions? Well, I think the main thing, the main misconception is about what psychiatry is and what psychiatrists do. Um, I think they, a lot of people still have this image of the psychoanalyst with the couch um, and an entirely uh, talking therapy-based approach. And of course, talking therapies are hugely important in psychiatry. But as I said before, we're a branch of medicine. Um, and I think, um, that's really where most of the misunderstanding comes and of course it's it's our bedrock in psychiatry is the biopsychosocial approach and it's actually quite a difficult thing to convey to people it sounds like um i mean even within the profession it can sound like well it means everything and it means nothing it's kind of uh, very vague um you know, what are you trying to say when you say, well, you believe in a biopsychosocial approach, but actually it's really very important and quite profound uh, when you think of trying to understand an individual's personality or motivation. And in every case, we know something from the neurosciences that can help us understand that from the, the brain biochemistry, from uh, the brain's wiring. Uh, there's something about psychology that helps us understand it from our the way we attend to things, our memory, how how that's filtered. And then, of course, we're all social beings and we're influenced by what our peers say, by ideas in the culture, by our shared beliefs. So almost any symptom or condition has to address all those elements. And that's really difficult. And the thing about the psychiatrist is he doesn't, he's not biased towards one or other. He's got to decide, he or she's got to decide which is the most relevant for this particular case in this particular context. Uh, but there's no hierarchy of explanation. And, and that's actually 
I think what makes psychiatry so fascinating, but it's A, it's difficult, and it's B, it's hard to convey to people that that's kind of what we do. And you have to deal with a lot of uncertainty because in almost every case, the extent to which there's a biological weight versus a psychological weight or a social weight is unclear. So to be a, psychi- to be a good psychiatrist, you have to have quite a strong ability to tolerate uncertainty, I think. Yes, absolutely. I mean, perhaps it's true that our the evidence base for our work is in some cases less secure than hematology that you mentioned. Um, so we do have to accept that and, and that it's a work in progress. Um, but yes, this balance of different influences, um, judgment comes in there. And, and I, I think in clinical practice, you have to just try and make the best decision you can and try and uh, share the uncertainty with the patient in front of you. Uh, not pretend that you, as the clinician, know everything. Um, and that's one way of dealing with uncertainty. The other thing is to take it away into your research and try and answer some of those questions through research. Yes, and you've done you've done a lot of research. So you've published over 650 peer-reviewed articles and part of what I'm interesting part of what I'm interested in exploring in this podcast is career development and what drives people what's what's driven you to have such a a a prolific career to produce so much at this level well I've been very lucky Um, I've worked in places where research was really highly valued and I've had some great uh, colleagues who I followed and uh, uh, worked with, and that's been enormously satisfying and great fun. Um, so yeah, I I I came to research um, when I well after I qualified in uh, as a doctor. I I wasn't one of those students who was always in the laboratory, um, who who had a, a strong science background and knew that they wanted to do research. It was only once I faced clinical problems that I realized that there were, there were so many unanswered questions and that, um, that my, you know, if I had some skill, it was in trying to span lots of areas uh, and have a broad understanding and see which one might be relevant rather than being a real specialist in any one thing or with a particular skill. I think nowadays research has become more sort of hyper specialized. And I think one probably does need to acquire a particular skill or, or, or detailed knowledge in one area and then, you know, become part of a team that applies that to a research problem. I think that, I, you know, my, my, career has seen a, a slight shift away from the kind of generalist who's got one foot in the clinic or one foot in the laboratory to, to really needing full-time kind of professional researchers, although they've got to talk to clinicians to, to understand what the problems are and to make sure that they're not going off in some tangent, uh, which does happen. Um, so so that was that's how it came to me. Um, it was very much grew out of clinical work. And then I found that I really enjoyed research. As I say, just the, the, uh, the people I, I was lucky enough to work with, I found them just so stimulating and the research world does have its benefits. Um, you know, traveling and and presenting your work is, is, is tremendously exciting. And I think full-time clinical work can be quite a burden um, after a while. Uh, And people often find something else to to take away from that. Sometimes people get interested in management. Sometimes they just um, develop other interests and uh, careers. But I think clinical research is a great way of dealing with it. It's a great balance between, you know, keeping your interest and your, your sort of compassion alive uh, and also um, you know working in 
with with scientific concepts, with uh, producing data and analysis and writing it up. So t- to me, it's a perfect uh, combination. Mm-hmm. What are some of the most interesting answers you've been able to discover through your research? You know, you say your research was a direct response to some of the mysteries and the questions that you faced in your clinical work. And that's obviously a really a good pragmatic approach. I think you alluded to the idea that sometimes researchers can be kind of siloed off in the academic world, too detached from the sort of hard realities of clinical problems. So it's really nice that you're able to combine the two in that way. And what are some of the more interesting answers you've been able to stumble upon through your research? Well, um, I, I guess my my core interest that has sort of kept me going o- over many years uh, is is this a question of insight in psychiatry, sp- especially in people with psychosis. Um, and I just I I just became interested in it because it was a term that people used uh, in the clinic and. They used it in different ways and and people sort of thought this was something important but then when you ask them to define what they meant they struggled so i i think what what i try to do is sort of conceptualize what insight really means and that it clearly had different elements it was a sort of multi-dimensional construct but there's something that you could um define uh, you could come up with scales where you could measure it in a way that was useful for research. You could show change. You could show correlations, some of which were quite surprising. Um, and then you could start to dig into uh, whether there was a kind of neuropsychological element to insight, which you know there clearly is. Uh, on the other hand, it can't be explained entirely like that, like I was saying before, you know, there are obviously social, cultural and psychological elements to to what we call insight. Um, But it's also very practical in that it predicts a lot about a patient's journey uh, in terms of whether they're going to be able to take, uh, to benefit from treatments uh, or to reject them, uh, to, to, to end up uh, being coerced into treatment rather than seeing the need for it, um, their relationships with their families, etc. The burden that carers find is very related to insight. So, so this one con- concept um, kind of spread and, and and took me into all sorts of different directions. Um, so that that's. Every one of those directions has been illuminating. Mm. Uh, so that's been a, a, a sort of major interest in mine over the years. And how, how would you explain the concept of insight to someone who's new to psychiatry or, or someone who's a layman? Yeah, well, I, I, th- I think uh, it's, it's about a person's awareness of their own uh, condition is what's essential to insight Um, but that can be at the global level do i have something wrong with me when i look at my own behavior my own beliefs uh, are these shared by other people if not are they wrong or am i wrong Um, so trying to answer that question as an individual i think we understand we, we start to understand what it's like uh, to to have a disorder and then to have to struggle to have insight into it and then so that's the sort of general case but then there's the specific cases of of say hallucinations how do we know that something we hear or see is real um, and again this is something that everyone can understand sometimes you wake up from a dream and in those first few moments you're really not sure, was that a dream or did that really happen? Um, We can all sometimes think we heard somebody calling our name. We look behind and there's nobody there. Was that in our imaginations or did we hear something? Did we mishear something? Uh, And we can, um, many people 
can imagine uh, pictures in their minds. Not everybody, as it turns out. Um, and sometimes these are very vivid. So psychologically, we must have ways to distinguish between what our imagination and what we're seeing in front of us that other people can see. So the second element of, of insight is about the specific nature of beliefs and perceptions rather than the overall uh, is this a condition or an illness that needs treatment it's did did this thing that i perceive or believe is that really shared by other people is it really real and then the final element is all these things do they need treatment and 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 again that seems like it's a very kind of specific and uh, rather modern idea but we don't necessarily mean does it need medication, um, for example, or therapy? What we're saying is, is this state I find myself in something that needs to be uh, managed or corrected or I need help with? So in that general sense, there's something that I, that, that I need restitution from. So those three elements, I think, are the, the key elements of insight. And we know that it's very common for people with a severe mental illness like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder to lack insight, to lack the awareness that they, like you said, that sort of global awareness that something is wrong, that second tier, that perhaps a hallucination isn't a reflection of outside reality, and that third tier that perhaps they have a problem that would warrant some sort of specialized attention, some sort of medical attention perhaps. Why is it the case that persons with these kinds of conditions so often lack insight? Yeah, well, <laughs> that's the big question. Um, and and there, there isn't a simple answer because some, some people, even with, say, schizophrenia or dementia, um, they do have insight. So a person with schizophrenia will say, you know, I, I hear these voices they feel very real to me, but I know that's part of my illness. I know there isn't really a person out there. It's just that, uh, you know, I can't, I can't not hear them or, you know, I, I know I, I'm not getting on as I should be in my life. Um, I, I'm troubled. Uh, there's something amiss and yet, you know, I'm still trying to carry on. Um, I know that the, the, the medication helps those voices, but sometimes I struggle with, you know, having to take it every day and to feel that there's something wrong with me. So I think it's very easy to understand uh, why people struggle with it. Uh, but we do find that, that, that there are, but there are brain mechanisms uh, that help all of us reflect on our um, states of mind. Uh, on our perceptions, um, give us confidence that, you know, that was real, that was not real. I, you know, I made a mistake. No, I'm very confident. So what that's now studied by psychologists under the heading of metacognition. So that's something that everybody has. And there's, there are brain networks that we know are involved with that, particularly medial frontal systems seem to be particularly involved with metacognition. So we have something that in the, in, in the healthy person, uh, we're beginning to understand uh, how it works. And so it's not a big leap to think that, well, if that system isn't quite working right, or if it goes awry, maybe that's what happens when someone has uh, a severe mental disorder. And so that system doesn't quite keep them on the, the, the straight and narrow and it um, misleads them into uh, false beliefs and false perceptions. Yes, and as you say, metacognition is something we all have to greater or lesser degrees. And when we think about insight, insight as a concept obviously doesn't just apply to people with a mental health condition. I work a lot in the psychotherapy world and we think of a very broad definition of insight you know, everyone has some degree of insight, the ability to, for example, be insightful about the overarching patterns of their life, you know, what situations they may fall into, common mistakes that they make, 
I, re I recently released an episode on self-sabotage all, all about this topic, the fact that we can continually make the same mistakes over and over again. So it, I think based on my clinical experience, I would very much view insight as a spectrum and we all have it to some degree or another. But my question is, do you think insight is something, can be, that, something that can be trained and improved upon? Particularly since, you know, even patients with more severe mental health conditions, often after a certain number of admissions, after a certain number of crises, that's when it, it begins to sink in that they may have a problem. And, and similarly, it's the case with psychotherapy clients that may take a number of years, but eventually um, certain insights about themselves may land. So do you think that insight is something that's neuroplastic, something that can be trained and developed, strengthened like a muscle? Oh, very much so. So there are um, metacognitive therapies that kind of target that ability to reflect on one's mental state, um, consider how we might um, be prone to biases or errors, and 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 sort of point those point those co common errors out to a person and help them. Um, uh, apply them to their own lives. So, so some of those therapies look quite promising, even when people with um, bipolar disorder or, or, or psychosis. Um, but also our medications uh, in, in, to treat uh, psychosis, we know they're effective, not for everyone, but for many people. And when a person is treated, their, their degree of insight changes. Um, so there's something about the psychotic state that impairs insight and that when that is improved, the insight returns. Of course, it's not a direct correlation because, like we say, you, you can have people who have very florid hallucinations and delusions and yet still understand that that's, there's something wrong. And, and similarly, you can have people who um, are not in a, a florid psychotic state um, and yet kind of um, don't process their uh, previous behaviors. Uh, they don't sort of l lay them down as something that to learn from. Uh, and you have this idea of, of a ceiling over uh, and the person just pushes that to one side. Uh, that was then and this is now and there's apparently no learning from experience so so that's the other side of the coin but yeah i think i, th I think insight is something that one can work on and uh, there are therapies that can aid it yes and probably it's also worth mentioning that very often developing psychological insight for anyone is not a pain-free process especially when it's about yourself an illness you may have difficult patterns and you know as psychiatrists we tend to maybe unconsciously think of insight as just good because if someone has insight that means they're going to be a bit more cooperative and their their prognosis is better and all of that's true but the process of coming to understand oneself for example understanding that one has a severe mental health condition it's a painful process there's a lot of painful realizations and often that compartmentalization, that sealing off you described is a valid way of the, the person protecting themselves, protecting their ego structure, however you want to phrase it. And in the short term, it can be useful because it can prevent, you know, a total sort of psychological breakdown. But really, it's in the medium to long term, I think, where insight really has its value and, and where kind of it's worth that short term pain because it gets you that those better results over the long, long arc. Yeah, I mean, Aubrey Lewis, who, who founded the London Institute of Psychiatry, wrote a paper in 1934, 90 years ago, and said it, that insight was a painful struggle, just as you've said, uh, because yes, we're when when we're asking a patient about insight we're always asking them to accept something bad i'm ill i was wrong you know it's never something good 
So you can understand the human need to, to try and avoid making that decision or to put it to one side. Um, and that's why there's just a, there's a very close link between mood and insight, which I think a lot of people misunderstand. Um, so what we find is that a lower a person's mood, more depressed a person is, um, the better their insight. Now, a lot of people think they know the reason. They think, well, obviously, if you understand and accept that you have an illness, that's a very depressing thought. And that makes you rather depressed. And, you know, that's conceivable. But another way of looking at it is that when your mood is lower and you've lost the sort of um, uh, biases uh, to see the world in an overly positive way and you're, you're looking at it more realistically, what some people call depressive realism, when you're a little bit low and you're seeing the world for what it is, you then are able to see your own imperfections as well as other people's and the world's imperfection. So it's maybe it's happening the other way around, that your lower mood allows you to develop insight. So that's one of the real conundrums about insight that we're still trying to understand. Yes, and that also implies that psychological health also includes a small dose of delusional optimism. And I could see that because, you know, ultimately we've been thinking and talking a lot about evolutionary psychology on the podcast. And I don't really think our brains mm -hmm. evolved to be purely reality oriented. Uh, I think a lot of our brain processes have evolved to be reality oriented, but part of the function of optimism isn't just to sugarcoat things. It's also to simulate a sort of a potential reality that could be. And in fact, when people are in an optimistic mindset, it's often oriented towards the future. It's an optimism about something that could happen. So I think a lot of the, a lot of our brains are evolved to, to figure out how things are in the moment, but then also this ability that's kind of unique to humans or maybe humans and a couple of other species to imagine a potential reality. Uh, and, yes. and that's pro part of the problem with depression. You're probably really well oriented to your present reality, as you described, but you're losing that ability to imagine something that that could come into existence, not 100%, not with 100% certainty, but something that could happen. And that's so important to drive us, to drive us forward in our lives and also obviously to make our moods better. Mm. Absolutely. Uh, I think that's absolutely right. Um, and in fact, I think I, I try and get into that in one of the, one of the cases in, in my book, um, Losing My Religion where it is about this idea of depression um, taking away a person's ability to see a, a positive future and that being so, so devastating. Yeah, that was one of the most interesting cases. Do you want to just walk us through that case? What, what happened? Yeah, this was a, a patient of mine um, who had a history of depression and he developed a, a depressive disorder. Um, he also had quite a strong faith belief, um, which, you know, didn't seem to be particularly relevant in, in, in his case. Um, but, I, uh, but it was clear that he was very depressed. He, he, he had been on, um, an antidepressant for many years and it had been very helpful but for whatever reason uh he developed this this relapse and um he was in the hospital and i remember in a in a uh, ward round uh sort of just touching in with him finding out where where he was how his mood was doing uh and it seemed like he was he he was improving um and he just let slip uh, that, by the way, um, all this religious stuff, religious nonsense. Yeah, he, he wasn't bothered with that anymore. He was just going to get on with his life. And at the time I thought, oh, well, OK, you know, uh, as a super rational person, I thought, well, that 
that's perhaps a, a good sign. Um, unfortunately, it wasn't, I think, in retrospect, a good sign. And uh, th th this was a, in a way, it was a um, quite a, it was a, a trap that many clinicians fall into in treating someone with depression, that the point at which they appear to be getting better uh, is actually quite a, a dangerous and vulnerable point. And um, he was very, very keen to leave the hospital and be with his family, um, who he was missing, and that all seemed perfectly understandable. But as it turned out, on, on a sort of trial period of leave, um, he took his own life. Uh, it was absolutely devastating. Obviously, uh, his family were, were completely devastated. And, and, you know, as a clinician, I felt terribly upset and felt that uh, I'd made a bad decision and uh, the rest of the staff similarly. Um, so it was, it was a, you know, sorry to start on such a sort of downer, but, but that's the reality of our work. That um, that that does happen, and it's the question is how we how we can learn from it, and I think uh, it is about understanding a person's need to conceive of a future, um, and that we were, I was I was drawn into re reading Emil Durkheim's classic work on on suicide, and he talked a lot about the power of religion. Uh, as a as a force for binding people together, uh, for giving people a a, gen, a a sense of purpose. Now, obviously, it's not the only thing that does that, and not everyone has a religious belief. But how that that is a protection against suicide, and this is he something that Dirk Keem, Durkheim found uh, going back 150 years, and it's probably still true today. So. Um, you know that was that was a, a rather sad story, but hopefully one that we can learn from. Yeah, so I guess the lesson from that case is that a, a patient can change in a way that to us looks great. You know, if we're super rational, if we're not so religious ourselves, mm. doesn't seem like a big deal. But what happened with that patient is, for one reason or or another. He, he lost a huge part of his meaning structure, his way of making meaning of his life, his past, and poten potentially, potentially his future, I guess. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, there, there, there are sort of psychological theories that, that help us understand that a, 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 as well. Um, the idea of a overly generalized memory where... Um, if you were asked to think of some happy events in your past, a uh, person who's rather depressed or at risk of suicide will, will only be able to produce general kind of memories. Yes, I, I, I remember, you know, when I was at college being a bit lonely or being quite happy rather than, oh, there was that time that we went to the park and we had a picnic and it rained and it was, you know, um, those sort of specific memories are much more useful when you're trying to say, what's the purpose of my life? Where, where am I going? If you can draw on those specific instances, they're really powerful, uh, even negative ones. But when everything is just a sort of gray generalization, uh, that really... Um, that that's a sort of risky situation. It, it it means that the person is sort of unmoored. They don't have anything to cling on to, uh, and uh, that's a sort of cognitive understanding of of exactly what we're discussing here. Mm -hmm. Do you think that, given we have to face cases as complex as this, and I've faced similar cases, you know, in my clinical work. As psychiatrists, we have a duty to not just understand the medical science, the biology, but we have a duty to be uh, to immerse ourselves in philosophy, existential philosophy of understanding the ways that people derive meaning from the world, obviously understanding people psychologically, getting a grasp of sociology as well. 
do you think it's our duty to immerse ourselves and this in, and at least be conversant in these different disciplines as well? I I mean I I kind of think so, but that's kind of uh, a little bit of a, a a bias. And in a way, um, when you think of well, what's the what's the ideal curriculum for a mental health professional? It's everything. It's the entire world li of literature and art and poetry, as well as everything in neuroscience and everything in social science. So, you know, we're, we're, we're limited in what we can really take in and understand. Uh, but I think it's, it's healthy that there is a strand of psychiatry and psychiatrists who are interested in sort of philosophical conceptual underpinnings of, of, of what we do. Um, and, and in a way, we rely on some of those people to, to simplify it for the rest of us and to, to make its relevant. In the same way that we rely on people who understand basic neuroscience and molecular biology, we can't all understand everything, but we do rely on them to, to sort of bring, bring back from the underworld uh, some nuggets of information that are important to us. So I think as a collective, uh, we have to uh, um, open our minds to all of these things. But, you know, we're only human and there's only so many hours in the day. Yeah, yeah. And on the other hand, I've done a lot of interviews recently with people very much critiquing viewing mental health problems through the lens of the biomedical mm. framework and that there are problems with it, it can be too restrictive mm -hmm. and close us off from those other ways of thinking about things which we just mentioned. Um, can you make the case, perhaps, giving a few examples, you know, that that the biological lens and the, the medical lens really is important uh, when when dealing with these sorts of problems. Yeah, I, and I think it's through stories, if you like, um, case histories, uh, but they're really stories. And, and the case histories in my book, um, they're based on on real people, but you know, there are some quite often an amalgam of several patients put together and obviously the, they're, they're disguised, but they are real deep down and they are stories. And I think through stories, we can sometimes understand the links uh, in, in, in a way that's easier than with by studying the, the basic sciences. But for example, um, there's also a, a, t a story there about a, a person who suffers quite a severe head injury he was a very keen cyclist and he got knocked off his bike and had a really quite severe head injury and in many ways made a very good recovery uh on on the surface but but deep down some very subtle changes had happened in the way he appraised uh himself and and reality in the way we've been talking about in regard to insight and he developed delusions about um uh not being really alive uh that we 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 attribute to to cotard and the cotard delusion as well as feeling that the world was not a real world and that he was in a sort of parallel world um it's a form of the capgra delusion um so none of that would have happened i'm sure if the person hadn't had a brain injury and you could see that um certain systems had been put out of action or connections between um, the emotional appraisal parts of our brain and the more uh, rational, like we were saying, metacognitive uh, aspects of our brain that put it out of balance and led to those abnormalities. Um, but the person still lives in the real world. He has a, he has a wife, he has a job. And, and so what, what I think a case history can tell you is how that physical damage and disorder can impact on a person's real life. So it, it needs both the neuroscientific understanding as well as a, an understanding of human nature and relationships to really, uh, to really help. And, and in that case, uh, it was a kind of psychological cognitive behavioral approach that was tried to bolster 
um, the kind of reality testing uh, that was somewhat helpful in his case in the end. Mm -hmm. So he was developed, learning to develop some insight as mm -hmm. well in a way that we described before. I mean, uh, again, I've had a lot of these interviews where there's a lot of pressure put on the biomedical mm -hmm. view of mental illness and and when we talk about it i'll be the first to acknowledge certainly that it's there's a lot of mystery mm -hmm. you know there's an absence of biomarkers but at the same time perhaps one of the foundations for for thinking for for the utility of the biomedical framework is simply that there's a lot of evidence that our first-hand subjective experience of the world is mediated by this organ mm -hmm. we call the brain we know every organ in our body can fail or it's 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 functioning can be disrupted in mm -hmm. all sorts of ways and there's no reason to think that the brain is exempt no, of course and that there aren't lots of different ways that the that the brain can't that its function can't be disrupted uh, and that that would obviously affect our first person subjective experience even if we don't fully understand the mechanism that that's in principle is what is happening uh, makes a lot of, makes a lot of, of sense. Of course, I mean, I mean, I can, I can look in the in 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 this in the in the book, um, and there's another case um, that I call "You Are What You Eat," um, and to, to cut a long story short, this is this is a, a rather unusual case, uh, but in the end, it's a, a person who has an eating disorder. Now. I think that's a good a good example for what you're saying. So we know very much that the way uh, the way we eat, the way we look at our bodies and our body shape, is hugely influenced by culture and societal expectations, and how that it's different for for men and women, and and these are very very powerful uh, forces. But equally, the uh, biological control of appetite uh, is again absolutely fundamental. It goes, you know, obviously no animal would survive uh, if it didn't have a very strong inbuilt control of its appetite and eating. Uh, so here you have, I think, the perfect sort of example of how you can't really understand one without understanding the other. Mm -hmm. Now let's take the opposite point of view. Where do you think the biomedical model of mental illness overreaches? Uh, where are, where is it too restrictive, or where is it not the best way of understanding a problem? Do you think? Well, uh, I think as we were saying, we should always think of the biopsychosocial model, and uh, when people talk about biomedical. Uh, it's a kind of slightly loaded term and it comes out particularly in cases where there's a, uh, it, where there's a contested view about the cause of the condition um, and often it's a case that um, that psychiatrists mental health professionals are more willing to take a kind of more general view so, so there are a lot of people who have physical symptoms um, and it might be what we call functional neurological disorders or conditions like chronic fatigue syndrome where the predominant symptom is a physical symptom. Uh, so we've got to understand what's happening in terms of physiology. And yet uh, the individuals themselves begin with a rather narrow and restricted biomedical view um, and the idea that, uh, that there are other factors that lead a person to feel fatigue for example uh, they reject totally uh, and and partly because of a misunderstanding of what that means and partly because they feel that any mention of psychological is it means it's not a real illness um, and, and those kinds of uh, misperceptions 
perhaps the stigma that they attribute to having anything that's mental health related uh, is just too much to bear. And so there are individuals, not the not our profession, but there are people out there whose very highly restricted biomedical view um, prevents them really uh, taking on board a more broad understanding that would actually help them. So, so I think. Mm, so yeah, that's a good point. In, in whose ever hands, uh, an overly restricted view is, is never going to be, uh, is never the full story. But yes, I think I think psychiatrists sometimes make the mistake as well of of relying too much on um, medication, uh, too too much on. Um, sort of uh, neurochemical explanations rather than seeing them in a, in a context of, of the person's life story and of what's going on around them. And, and so, yeah, there, there's sometimes too many people are on medication. Uh, I think this is happening now uh, with lots of adults uh, seeking a diagnosis of um, ADHD and or of autism. Uh, and I think although these are interesting uh, areas and uh, it's quite uh, it's quite appropriate for uh, a person to consider those conditions as an adult. Uh, and it may well be that they were missed early on in their life. But I do get the strong sense that uh, there's although it's a sort of grassroots movement. Uh, you know, partly it's what what's called the neurodiversity movement, which is obviously a very positive and strong uh, grassroots movement. But I think there are uh, clinicians who um, overly uh, subscribe to the view. Sometimes they're part of it themselves, and they see that a a, a medical label or a medication. Is, is the answer is a, is a simple answer to a complex problem. Yeah, and I, I think you see that with really common mental health presentations as well, like depression and anxiety, where we have a modern world that's increasingly turbulent, that's changing at a very fast pace. There are many factors in society, which if you just look at them on paper, you can see why they would cause a lot of mental distress. Mm. You know, we're living a more isolated, atomized existence. Our food landscape of the past few decades is unrecognizable. Mm. Our lifestyles have changed so much. And sometimes I almost feel like psychiatry is being forced to take responsibility for the increased mental health difficulties people are experiencing as a result of all these enormous, these seismic social, social and, and cultural mm. shifts as well. Yeah, I, I think that's right. Um, but it's always complicated. So you see the number, the, the, the number of people who are on antidepressant medication. And there are a lot of tabloid headlines that uh, scream out, you know, how, how the, the, it seems like everyone's on a an SSRI. That there are too many people taking medication, and I think first of all, depression, anxiety—they're common, and uh, a lot of people are helped by the medication. But there is a feeling that um, some people um, are not really benefiting from the medication. It should they they should be helped to to stop, and at the same time, there are people who should be on medication that, despite the use and perhaps overuse of some medications, they're still not getting the medication that they need. So there, so it it's not it's not that there's just too much medication or over medicalization. It's a lack of precision in the way that we use these tools, these quite powerful tools, we're still missing people who, who need them and we're still hitting people who really don't need them. So it's, it's a complex, it's, it turns out to be like everything in our field, more complex than meets the eye. Yeah, it's the hardest part of psychiatry is to figure out 
which interventions would benefit which yeah. patient. And then even within that, there's complexity. Like if someone has depression, you need to figure out, do you think antidepressants, among other things, are an appropriate option? But then we also don't yet have a sophisticated means of knowing which antidepressant to try because some work so differently from others. And we know we have some means of trying to determine, you know, which kind of antidepressants mm. try first. But they're not that sophisticated yet and that's unfortunately where the the remaining mystery within neuroscience persists and and why it's so important that sort of ongoing research happens to try and try and uh, shed some light on, on this mystery yeah absolutely and and uh, and i think a lot of uh the research is trying to answer those questions um and my my impression is that there uh, the researchers are a little bit too eager to claim a victory before they've really achieved it. Uh, we're always being told now that we have precision medicine, that we have personalized medicine, but really, uh, if we're honest, it hasn't really made much of an impact in our field as it has in other fields of medicine, like you know cancer, etc. Uh, so we've got to keep trying um, um, and use all the tools available which are probably going to include better characterization at the phenomenological level it's in terms of psychopathology. So those old skills, as well as um, genetics uh, and large scale data processing. Uh, so all of, all of that, I think that's where research is heading at the moment. Uh, it's uh, it's a big enterprise, a sort of industrial scale, and I'm hoping in the end it will yield dividends. Mm. Early in your book, you mentioned the Scottish psychiatrist R.D. Lang as being an uh, early influence for you. What what do you think is the value of his work, and why should young training mental health professionals still read R.D. Lang? Yeah. Um... He he was a sort of hero of mine, and and I went to the same university, Glasgow University, um, and he was a kind of uh, because he was a radical and a, and a, a critic against the establishment. Um, you know, I fell for that. We we we, we all uh, are attracted to that, I think. Uh, but even later, when you can sort of t sit back. And perhaps reread some of those early works. You you can see that there's some amazing insights in in there. Uh, his ability to really unpack delusions and see them in their context, um, in terms of uh, a person's sense of self that we were talking about a bit earlier. I think those were really that they, they they've lasted uh, the test of time. He he also wanted to. Uh, humanize the care of people with particularly schizophrenia and people with chronic conditions. He didn't have the the, the kind of training and the, the background to really be able to to do that in a uh, systematic way. Um, but he tried. He he tried his best, and and they had some experimental uh, ward setups um, that were much less restrictive and. Uh, more humanizing so those are, i think the very positive legacies i think there there are some negatives um i think in his later work he sort of questioned the whole idea of mental illness he made some sort of slightly outlandish claims uh based on not very good evidence so i think a mature understanding can see that there were some great great uh, achievements as well as a few missteps but it's, but I'd still recommend um, people today to read, especially the divided self, which was his first book, and then you know make up your own mind, see whether there are things in there that you you think uh, really uh, enlighten you, and other things that perhaps you think well that doesn't really stand up today. So importantly, you mentioned the humanizing of people with conditions like schizophrenia, psychosis, but also, and I guess Lang goes into this in The Divided Self, the decision as a psychiatrist to view someone's psychotic symptoms 
such as hallucinations or the nature of their delusions as an important set of data that you can use to understand the person's psychology, to understand where they're coming from. Like there might be a reason that someone's having a grandiose delusion, for example, that they think they're uniquely gifted or that they're a prophet versus someone else who has a paranoid delusion that people are against them, that these aren't just the kind of uh, manifestations of a diseased brain, but they provide important clues as to a person's sense of self and, and how they feel they exist in the world. Is, am, I, am I getting that correctly? I think that's, that's a, a, a fair description. And, and yes, uh, he drew on existential philosophy to try and understand what the person was saying in that context, rather than just saying, this is just madness. Um, and I think that was a, a very brave and brilliant step. I think now we, we can use cognitive science and, and cognitive psychology uh, to give us another kind of perspective in terms of like what we were saying before, reality testing in terms of metacognition. Um, that also gives us a way of understanding for example, hallucinations and delusions without just saying it's just rubbish. It's just bad data. Uh, there's something it, it's telling us about how all of our minds work and how that it can sometimes take a, a turn. So so I think that that's a very valuable uh, lesson that we, we can take from him. Mm -hmm. I'd like to end talking a little bit about neuropsychiatry you're a neuropsychiatrist what's the what's the difference between being a neuropsychiatrist and a psychiatrist what kind of patients or conditions do you see commonly mm -hmm. yeah i mean i think it's it's a it's an, a small area of psychiatry in clinical practice although its implications for the whole of psychiatry i think are very deep um but you could say it's the area of overlap between neurology and psychiatry. So it's the area where people with neurological conditions have prominent mental health problems and that uh, the neuropsychiatrist has to be uh, reasonably up to date and informed about neurological conditions, especially uh, uh, brain conditions and how they might give rise to uh psychopathology uh and then accepting that the treatment approach might have to be slightly different might not be but it might be so it's that uh, that's that's the kind of main overlap but then there is this other group of people who appear to have a neurological condition and whose main symptoms are in the realm of neurological conditions weakness paralysis blindness but they don't seem to have a structural cause in their ne central nervous system that explains it. And, and that's the area of functional neurological disorders. So, so the neuropsychiatrist uh, has to deal with both, you might say the both extremes. Um, and and it, it, does, it does create a really interesting area of clinical practice and research. Uh, but I say its implications beyond that are, are, are much much wider. I mean, I'm. I mean, it, the 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 interesting thing is that even in in the UK, uh, there are quite there's quite a few, only a few practicing neuropsychiatrists, whereas the potential need is is really great. And uh, I'm at the moment the the president of the International Neuropsychiatry Association. And there are people in other areas of the world, uh, some lower income com countries where there's one or two people who are the only neuropsychiatrists in the whole uh, country. Uh, and, and, and there's a real need to, to support them and help them with training and, and uh, uh, other kinds of support. Uh, but, but yeah, it, it makes for a fascinating area of, of work. Mm -hmm. So that second uh, extreme that neuropsychiatrists deal with, where people have sympt a symptom or symptoms that seem very neurological, like paralysis of a limb or blindness, as you mentioned, 
uh, that's called functional neurological disorder that used to be called conversion disorder back in the day the idea that a psychological problem is converted into a physical symptom is that still the thinking that it is a psychology converted to 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 a physical experience or has the thinking changed yeah i think the thinking has changed but that that remnant of that old idea going back to freud that that still lingers on but i think we do have a bit of a broader understanding um that a per, it, it we don't really see these as psychological conditions but again uh, a mixture a biopsychosocial mixture and that um the way uh we deal with feedback from our body uh so the sense that we are um the sense of effort that we have when we try and raise our hand or lift a limb something's gone wrong with that feedback system perhaps so the person says well i'm trying to move my limb but it's just not working so that you know what's going wrong there or or the person with a, a sensory deficit who um the physiological tests show that uh the brain is reacting to the uh, external sim stimulus as you would imagine but the person's conscious experience is different from that so it really pushes the boundaries of of what uh neuroscience can understand but we find in that higher rates of of other kinds of uh ordinary if you like psychopathology depression and anxiety we find that in some but not all people have had some history of trauma and uh that has led to dissociation this ability to kind of compartmentalize one's mind uh to push things aside to perhaps not feel things in the way uh that we would normally do and um, and all of those strands seem to add up in some people to ending up in a functional neurological disorder but what we find is rather than trying to seek out some mystery uh psychological explanation or trauma as would be in the freudian days uh i think just understanding physiological mechanisms and retraining an individual to learn more about the feedback from their body uh to find different ways of um motor programs for moving and walking uh in a way that people with parkinson's disease can sometimes carry out uh complex activities uh when it's uh when it's just um kind of automatic but they can't do it when they set down to do it um the same things apply to people with functional and neurological problems and using those insights i think uh we can really uh lead to some very dramatic uh recoveries okay so in your experience then the best approach is actually not to approach it from a depth psychology point of view a trauma point of view but rather just to to retrain those physiological feedback mechanisms as you described that that's what the the evidence suggests yeah that's right first of all there may not be that hidden trauma um mm. and sometimes you know our field has a history of making mistakes um and and sort of finding a trauma where it doesn't really exist we do that as often as missing ones that do exist so uh but that doesn't seem to be the key to recovery or helping a person recovery a uh, recover of course there may be a time later when a person wants to talk more about their psychological life as well as their physical life but the 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 priority is to get the person you know out of bed or moving again or seeing again and that doesn't require in-depth psychology mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and what in terms of just your general approach to patients you know what would you tell a training mental health professional some of the maybe more poignant lessons you've learned about how to approach patients in general well um you know i obviously obvi so i like i enjoy mentoring and 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 teaching people but uh i don't feel that i've got some 
you know, particular um, sort of uh, truths that I need to impart. I think there's a there's a I I think I benefited from a really good training uh, where um, what we what we used to do was uh, record ourselves, video record ourselves talking to a patient, obviously with their with their permission, and then we'd show those back to the class, and it could be quite excruciating sometimes, but because everybody did it, it, it felt good. And you could just see where you were missing things, where you had said something clumsily, um, or when something you said that you didn't really think much about really made a, a positive impact. So I think it's it's about being incredibly reflective of what you're doing, uh, being very open to feedback and, and criticism, and see it see it as a sort of continual learning process. So I think that's the key to being a mental health professional. Yeah, definitely. And I advocate recording yourself, role playing with your colleagues and videotaping yeah. that. I mean, I've even led to the process of doing this podcast, recording myself on audio and video. Talk about painful insight. It's <laughs> extremely <laughs> painful at times, but yeah. extremely useful because it's this continual process of identifying the, the mistakes that you made commonly which just yeah. makes it so much so much easier to correct uh professor tony david thank you so much for joining me today into the abyss uh psychiatrist notes on a troubled mind i'd recommend whether you're a member of the public someone training in mental health or if you're qualified very accessible it's kind of how i designed the podcast in a way accessible so that anyone can get something from it but at the same time does not sacrifice depth you go into a lot of depth, you will come out of reading that book very, very, um, with some really useful insights, very, very fascinating case studies. Thank you so much for talking to me today. Well, thanks very much for those kind words. And it's been, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.